Dadhood. Modern Dadhood Podcast. Feeling alright? I feel good for a Tuesday night. That's good. Hey folks, welcome back. This is Modern Dadhood, an ongoing conversation about the joys, the challenges, and the general insanity of being a dad in this moment. My name is Mark Checkett, and I'm a dad to twin three-year-olds, both boys. Changed it up a little. You did. I like it. Yeah. It works. Yeah. I thought it through. I hadn't said it out loud until just now, but it feels right. My name's Adam Flaherty. I'm a dad to two girls who are seven and four. We got an episode today. We do, and you. Ha- I I just thought of something. I have two kids. You have two kids. That makes four in total. That's right. Our guest today, a guy by the name of Brian Manor, a dad to also two kids. What a coincidence! Mm-hmm. That that's so unlikely. It's almost impossible. That makes six kids total, if anyone's counting. Three boys, three girls. That's right. So, stay tuned, and you're going to listen to our conversation in a little bit. You asked me how I'm feeling at the top of the episode, but I neglected to ask you how you are feeling. I'm starting to feel good. Is it because you got your shot yesterday? Yeah, I got uh, got my shot. What an experience that was. You get the P? Mm-hmm, I got the Pfizer. What if I told you this? Mm. I got the P yesterday, too. You got the P? Mm-hmm. You got some P in your A? <laughs> yes, in my upper A. <laughs> Did you get some P in your upper A? And now, and now my upper A is, is feeling a little uncomfortable. Yeah, it gets a little tight. A little heavy. It's, yeah. I haven't had quite that much P in my upper A in some time, so that's, I think that's why it's extra tight. Yeah. Just take it there, man. It's cool. Yeah, no, it was... Um, I don't know. What, what was your experience like? Did you... What was the location of where you got your shot? <laughs> I was in what used to be a department store and is okay. now, now a, a large, empty building. But Me it was too. fine. I mean, it was clean. I didn't yeah. have to wait long. Everybody was really friendly. It was very quick and easy. How nice. About you? Nice. Um, yeah, I waited for a while. Um but it was, we were constantly moving. They're just, I just think there was a lot of people right around that same time. People were pleasant um, and they really had it together, you know, but it, I don't know. I was just really weirded out by the whole thing. Cause we, mine too was in an old department store that is no more. You'd look in one direction and it was like, there were lights, there was some order, nice signage. And then you'd turn and you'd look off and there'd just be like a dark corridor, (laughs) you know? And like, I kept feeling like I was in like an episode of like the walking dead or something, you know, like just was very surreal. Um, and it was amazing though, too, at the same time, it was like, what an effort, you know, what, like a huge undertaking and to see it happening there to make them to get them to where they are today into my upper A. (laughs) It's incredible. (laughs) It it is super impressive. Yeah, very thankful for that. I have to admit, I feel a little underprepared to have a conversation about mental illness. You do? A little bit. In the sense that? In maybe... uh, I understand how prevalent it is, Mm. but I feel like maybe I'm still a little bit ignorant to it just because I Uh, haven't dealt with it personally myself. Yeah, uh, I put myself in that same boat. Here's something that I was thinking about. Do you think it's fair to say that when we were young kids, when we were that, what a weird emphasis. Hold on. Do you think it's fair to say that when we were young, that the topic of mental health was treated very differently than it is today? Probably. But I guess that's a question of, was it not as prevalent there or was it not as diagnosed or was it just more taboo than it is now? I guess you'd have to probably say it's a combination of all of those things. But I I was thinking that a lot of it has to do with the last thing that you just said. The fact that there's a certain stigma because the stigma is there today. Mm-hmm. And we've we've come quite a ways, I think, since 
you and I were, I don't know, little teeny tiny kids. Cause I mean, even today we still hear the words mental health usually, or like mental health issue or something, you know, along those lines around like really drastic or extreme situations, you know, sure. like the, the terms get thrown out almost as if like, I don't know, a way to put ourselves at ease when something really horrible happens, when a, a person does an extreme thing that's beyond comprehension. It's like we kind of go there with it. Do you think yeah. it's used as like an excuse? I think in some cases, yes, depending mm. on what the act was. But that's we it's kind of a weird mechanism because it's not something that we should look at as like, oh, it's a mental health issue. Now we don't have to talk about it anymore. And that's not necessarily what they're saying, but when you enter into the conversation through that, yeah. you're entering into it in a really stigmatized environment. You're just like you're you're at, you're just connecting it to that act. And so we're looking at it, we're examining it in a biased way right out of the gate this is true but also consider this when somebody's brought through the court system for committing a crime their Mm. defense will always use that as part of their argument for why Mm. the punishment should be lessened which doesn't help No, it doesn't help. That sort of always being a a, a gateway into the conversation is that it just exacerbates the stigma surrounding the topic when you can have so many different levels of quote unquote mental health issue. And then I start to wonder, do some people not want to reach out for help with something that they're dealing with? Because either a they don't feel like they fit that extreme narrative. And so they don't think that's well, really not an issue because I'm like, I'm not ready to do something extreme or drastic. Right. Or B, they don't want other people to think that about them. And so that being like a part of the national discussion or most visible discussion, I feel like it deters certain people from seeking out help early on. Well, it's interesting you should say that because I actually came with a few statistics and the last couple really sort of align with what you were just saying. So first of all, roughly one in five adults in the U.S. experience mental illness, which is crazy. Mm. One in five. Mm. Now, one in 20 experience serious mental illness. And of course, that's the level of severity is determined based on things like how long the person has experienced it and and the Hmm. level of disability that it produces. But it's things like severe depression and Mm. schizophrenia and severe bipolar disorder that would fall into that category of serious mental illness. So one in 20 people suffer from serious mental illness in the United States. But what relates to what you were saying is that I was reading that anxiety disorders are very treatable, but only about 37% of people who suffer from anxiety disorders receive treatment. Hmm. I also read that 36% of people with social anxiety disorder report going 10 years or more before having it treated. See that? I believe that a large part of those people who are reluctant to take measures to seek out some kind of help for themselves are held back for reasons like it's not bad enough, you know, like it doesn't fit, it doesn't fit into that category. Right. So who am I to go out there and say, I'm having this trouble. Everybody experiences some level of anxiety over things. At what point, if you're not talking to, your doctor or uh, any sort of professional or provider about it. How do you self, you know, determine Mm -hmm. that your anxiety is more severe than somebody else's to the point where you should seek help? That's a great point. And that what I start to think about when I hear stuff like that from, from people like Brian, or when I hear statistics like that, that there's large percentages of people who are suffering in some capacity, but don't seek out, you know, uh, help or treatment in any way is a lot of it is our inability to name it, to identify it, to, Mm -hmm. to, to understand really what's going on. And then I started thinking back to when we were kids and that's what led me to my first question. And we go through so many years of school 
And, you know, we have like gym class. <laughs> so there's some health considerations and we have health classes, sure. but we don't really, I don't think sit down and treat m- mental health as its own specific topic that we've got to inform and educate ourselves on from an early age. And I think that's a huge missed opportunity. We talked a, a little bit about it when Scotty Isari was on the show. That's right. And also how to deal with trauma in your life. Right. Um, I mean, it could it, be, but, it could be a death of a family. It doesn't have to be, you grew up in a physically abusive household. Right. It doesn't have to be something that's like extreme that everybody can point to and say, no wonder that person is the way they are. It could be something as, yes, you experience a death in the family at a young age or something that you just didn't even really fully understand. Sure. Or there's a, there are addiction issues in the family, alcoholism, you exactly. know, anything, any number of yeah. things. Anything that's sort of under that sort of big, heavy life experiences, trauma, abuse, and not having the ability to work through an experience like that can lead to mental health issues or illness down the line. And I just wonder if education around all of this beginning at a younger age would make everybody more comfortable talking about it. And I would like to think that it would bring the staggering statistics down yeah and lead to more people getting help which they should not feel ashamed to ask for i want to welcome brian manor to the conversation brian's a dad to a five-year-old daughter and a two-year-old son He is a team supervisor for a blood collection organization in Wisconsin, and he writes a blog about his experience as a dad called Fatterhood, which you can find on Facebook. So welcome, Brian. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. How are things in Wisconsin? Good, good. The weather's finally turning around. (laughs) (laughs) We had a really nasty cold snap, so it was great to finally kick the kids outdoors and let them explore. I'm very glad spring is here. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us a little bit about your family. Uh, well, like you had mentioned earlier, my uh, I got a almost five year old. She'll be turning five in April and uh, her name's Elizabeth. She is all of her father. And it's very hard to parent the me <laughs> out of a five year old. Um, she's too much like me. That's just all there is to it. That's why her and I butt heads all the time. She's stubborn as all hell. She's too smart for her own good. She's cute and she knows it. Um, Well, that part I can't relate to, but (laughs) she's all over that. Um, Then my son, Roman, uh, he'll be three in July. He is very much like his mother. He's always into something. He's always got to be moving or outside or hiking or running or whatever. But he's uh, he's also too smart for his own good. He just chooses to use his genius for evil every time. (laughs) Uh, But he's also the the sweetest kid you'll ever meet in your entire life. He'll tear apart my work bag and then see how upset I am and then just come up and give me a giant hug. And I'm so sorry, Daddy, I won't do it again. We both know full well he's going to do it again, but (laughs) he genuinely feels bad, too. So, no, they're just. They're really great kids. They're goofy. They are funny. They're the most accidentally funny people I've ever met. They don't always get why they're being so funny, but they are my reason for getting up in the morning most days. That's awesome. I I love that, like that ability that kids have to take you right to the brink of like, you're like, you're working on your last nerve. And then like, just like that, they're just like the most adorable (laughs) most wonderful little thing. They come, they give you a little hug. They say something like, I love you. And you're like, why do you do this to me? <laughs> yeah, All of the frustration. Why do you do this to yeah. me? <laughs> um, so Brian, so we'd love to hear a little bit about fatterhood and the inspiration behind starting it. Can you talk a little bit about that to us? Yeah, I started it. It'll be five years ago in May. Uh, it was when I was out on paternity leave, you know, I was, Board. I'm in a pretty high, high performing job. So I never really had a chance to just sit ever. And all of a sudden I'm on paternity leave and trying to bond with my kid. And I realized as much as that was 
awesome for me. I was bored, <laughs> really, really bored. So I started posting stuff on Facebook, just like uh, I think the first one that kind of was the impetus for it was after her umbilical cord had fallen off. Uh, I posted, oh, no, parts already falling off this kid. Can I return her? <laughs> Is she under warranty? <laughs> Perfect. And then all of a sudden I had friends like, oh, my gosh, you should, you know, write a blog or do mm. something like. So I I did. I listened to my friends and I started doing that. I, I guess I view it almost like a baby book for them. Eventually they'll be able to see all the trials, tribulations, foibles, fun times, everything else mm -hmm. that came along while they were growing up. A lot of your posts are written in a way that is uh, it's basically an open letter to the two of them, which is really sweet and will certainly make really nice material for them to return to when they're older. As part of your blog, you know, you're very forthcoming about your struggles with mental health. Would you mind giving our listeners some of your history with that? Uh, sure. Um, you know, I, I've, I've always been pretty open with it. There's to me, it's just never been anything to be ashamed about. Uh, but I get why so many people aren't as forthcoming with it. Uh, it started for me when I was very young. Uh, it was actually in second grade that they identified that I had some pretty serious signs of clinical depression. I had a very serious attempt to hurt myself at that time. Hmm. And then it pretty much never got any better from there. Not until quite recently. I believe I'm up to five suicide attempts since second grade. Uh, hmm. Thank goodness. <laughs> like I'm not, uh, I'm not necessarily proud of any of these things either. Uh, that's far from the word I would choose, but I've, I'm just not ashamed of it. It's bad brain chemistry. After years and years and years of therapy, I don't think there's really an impetus for it. I don't think that there's a serious bit of trauma. I am genetically predisposed to terrible brain chemistry. Hmm. My hmm. mom had had a bipolar disorder growing up, so she was always super open with me. Um, it was just the two of us. My dad had left when I was very young, but I also never heard anyone else ever talk about it, not openly. Hmm. So even though I wasn't ashamed, I kind of assumed it was just us. Immediately, she got me help. I've been in some form of behavioral health care pretty much ever since, off and on since second grade now. So as you've learned more about the conditions and become more familiar with how they personally affect you, you said you've been in some form of behavioral therapy for decades. So yep. thinking back on all of the various practitioners that you've spent time with, do you think that there are things that they have misunderstood or misdiagnosed or anything that they could have or should have done differently that would have gotten you to a better place before just recently? You know, it, it's really tough when I was starting out that young. Diagnosing mental health conditions in children is not an exact science. Mm. I actually technically wasn't able to be labeled as depressed in second grade. You can't diagnose a seven-year-old with depression. I mean, in hindsight, is there things that I wish they could have done different? Sure. But there's also, they got their rules, their diagnostic criteria. Right. But it was, I think I was about 27 or 28 when I was diagnosed with anxiety. And that's the one that threw me for a loop. I was like, I started seeing a, a different doctor. My normal doctor was out. So I actually had to see uh, his fill in. And we started talking about some stuff and she goes, Brian, I, I think you might have an anxiety disorder hmm. and being in and out of some form of mental health treatment for, you know, well over 20 years at that point, I was like, I know enough about this. It's not anxiety. And she started asking me follow-up questions and I was kind of blown away. I was like, well, doesn't everyone do that? She goes, yeah, to an extent, but have you like lost sleep over that thing you said 10 years ago? Mm. <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, but that was really stupid. And I've ruminated on it for a decade. <laughs> you know, she goes, that's, that's not normal. That's not what everyone oh, does. Man. And all of a sudden, you know, a lot of things started clicking into place for me. And I was like, oh, no, 
And a lot of times symptoms of depression can mask symptoms of anxiety hmm. um, and vice versa. And that's been the struggle the last couple of years for me. Do I wish we had found that sooner? Yeah, I get why it was so hard. I'm really good at masking it. I always have been. So it, I think that would have changed some of the dialogue, the therapy, the treatment over the years. But you don't know what you don't know until you realize you don't know it either. You talked a lot about a lot of things that there is a stigma around. There's kind of just a stigma around the topic of depression or mental health or anxiety. But then when you talk about it just in terms of being a, a guy, right, there's a whole <laughs> other sort of part of that, that stigma that's attached to it. I know some of it kind of just comes from this notion that depression or anxiety or any of these things for some reason is a sign of weakness, right? Like Mm. that seems to be a narrative that you, (laughs) that you hear or that you read or you see sometimes, but what do you say to someone who might think that that's true? I've heard that before, Mark, a a thousand times. Like I kind of toss that criticism aside. Like, I'm sorry, I've been living with it for over 20 years. Like, I'm not a mental health expert by any stretch of that word, but I've been through it. So I do know what I'm talking about. It's not weakness. It was bad wiring. And I hear a lot of, I don't want to go to therapy. They're going to put me on drugs or I don't want my family to know. And that'll be make things weird. I was going to check on my friend, but I didn't want to make things worse. And I'm like, oh, gosh, oh, yeah, like, you do what you can to overcome it to treat it, to live with it. Right. And that was actually very surprising for me once I finally became more out and open with it. I was expecting some version of uh, pity, I guess, for lack of a better term. And what I found was patience. It wasn't pity. Hmm. If all of a sudden I'm like, you know, I'm not sure I want to come out to this thing tonight. They, they know me, they know my Hmm. triggers. Uh, Even at work, I've just been very open about it with my team saying nine times out of 10, if I'm snaking out on you for something, I'm not mad at you at all. You happen to be the first one I ran into. That is not an excuse for my behavior, but I need you to know it's not you. Um, but more to your point, Mark, I, you're, you're right. Specifically for guys, there seems to be a huge stigma. It's not until quite recently that I would say, I kind of hate conversations framed this way because it almost sounds like the, you know, poor white guy. So feel bad for me, but it, but it's true for guys in general, regardless of race or socioeconomic income or anything like that. We haven't been able to talk about our emotions or what makes us happy, sad. We've basically had happy and anger. So that's been the fun part about having kids is I get to explore my emotions a little bit better. It sounds like t- to me, someone who has not you know, suffered with depression or anxiety like that. So I I feel like what we need are people like you who do deal with this day in and day out, who have the ability or feel okay being open and talking about it, because that's how we as a society learn more and learn to be comfortable and learn how to ask the, the right questions. You know, I think, I think just historically, it's a topic that's been, kind of taboo for people to talk about. It's becoming more commonplace. Um, Chris Gethard, he did a one-man show a couple years ago called Career Suicide, and that's his struggles with mental health. And the first time I heard that, I was just like, whoa, someone else is doing the same thing that I thought I was doing, but he's obviously doing on a way bigger scale. Chris Gethard is amazing. He's hilarious. Oh, my God. I love that dude in his book. And he's not a mental health expert either. You know, he's just talking about it and that gets people thinking about it and gets rid of that stigma that you guys were referring to. And then um, Hannah Gatsby, she did the Netflix special Nanette. Yep. Mm. Talking about it from a whole different side of things there, too. Yeah, she's great. Hearing people be more confident and capable and using the correct lingo that we all understand and getting that message out there helps. Brian, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how does your depression and and anxiety affect your role as Elizabeth and Roman's dad? Uh, Well, like I said, uh, over the years, it's been a coping mechanism, but I've become very good at masking it. 
Um, that's also what has been made treating it very difficult over the years. The the tough part is I'm in a you know customer facing outward role, so I have my customer service face on all day. The last year in particular has been a nightmare uh, in multiple ways. So I've had to keep my brave mask on hmm. for all my staff. And when I get home, I don't want my kids to know how tired and frustrated and drained and everything I am. So I got my dad mask. Uh, it's not uncommon for me to spend five, 10 minutes out in the garage before I walk in the house just to recollect myself and get my mask on so that they don't have to see that. But where it gets tough is when that mask slips. If uh, I had a really rough day and all of a sudden one of them just goes too far over the edge and I yell or I just need to go outside or whatever it may be. And I can really beat myself up for that. Where I think most of the time, most other parents are like, yeah, they just got on my last nerve. I said, whatever. It's fine. I'll go into a two day depression bout because I snaked out, but they, uh, th- they're good. And my wife is the, she needs to be canonized for uh sainthood. <laughs> she's the one that usually can see when I'm percolating and actually, she's the one that I would feel the the worst for. I'm, I'm usually pretty good. We have conversations with the kids. It's, you know, how you got really frustrated last week because uh, Roman took your toy. Well, daddy just got really frustrated today, too. So he needed to take a break just like you did. So having those conversations has been really important and very helpful. What do your kids understand? I mean, you you use the phrase the dad mask, which it makes such perfect sense. Do your kids have an understanding of this part of you? A, a very, very, you know, low level understanding. I don't think we've ever labeled it as anxiety or depression with her or anything like that. But she has an idea of it. Yeah. Uh, Roman, I don't think would care right now. <laughs> He's too busy getting into stuff all the time. <laughs> yeah. How does your family history of of mental health issues frame the way that you and and Cheryl talk about your kids and their future? Uh, whew. well, I, I'm kind of terrified that the that there is a heavy genetic component to it. Uh, I can already see it a lot of times with my daughter. I try to stay out of my head with it because you can't diagnose that in children. Mm -hmm. But I see so many behaviors that both of them do, but Elizabeth in particular, (laughs) that I'm like, ooh, that's out of your dad's playbook right now. So then it's trying to figure out, is that a learned behavior? Is that something I can try to unlearn with her? Or is that ingrained in her? Um, One of my favorite quotes of all time is from another podcaster, Marcus Parks, from the uh, last podcast on the left podcast. Mm-hmm. He's very open with his mental health. And the thing he always says is mental health is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Mm. The first second mm-hmm. I heard that, that's when it really clicked for me. I'm like, you're right. This this isn't my fault. Calling it a victim seems a little too much, but it is my responsibility to take care of it. That's really powerful, that 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 notion that it's, it's not your fault, but it's your responsibility. I'd I'd never heard that before. And that's, that is really powerful. You know, we've learned in, in the fairly recent past that mental health issues are very common. I I don't know the numbers, but I know that when you, you dissect that with new fathers, it's astounding how many new fathers experience something like a postpartum, you know, depression or an, you know, a level of anxiety that they're not familiar with. It's, it's astounding, but it still can feel really taboo to discuss openly. So is there anything that you'd like to say to any of the dads listening right now that might resonate uh, with your, who might resonate with your story? Oh, for sure. I mean, the, the biggest one is you're not alone at all. That was the, the most impressive thing to me is the more I got open about it, the more people that said, oh, that happens to me too. Or, hey, I need to go get checked out myself or, or that were very patient and understanding, even if they hadn't experienced anything like that. As far as advice for dads, get checked out. And a great place to start is your just general care physician. That's where I started. 
also don't get discouraged if you know you do get a referral or you go to your doc and it didn't go the way you were hoping for shop around a little bit i i know that that's a little bit of a place of privilege depending on where you live mental health care providers are kind of in short supply nationwide and then the other side with that is it can be hard but you got to be open and honest with them you know i i'm the one that has to do it you can't ultimately help someone that doesn't want to be helped either it sounds like the overarching advice is to own it to not be ashamed of it and to talk about it and we're so glad to hear that you are in a good place right now and absolutely hope that that continues from following along to fatterhood a humorous new dad's blog on facebook it's very clear that you are an awesome dad and just like we all are, you're just doing our best. And uh, we're really grateful to have you on the show. Well, thank you guys for having me. I mean, honestly, it's uh, I've, I've been a listener from the start. I think the work you guys are doing is extremely important and I love it. And I was a little anxious because, I mean, for crying out loud, you guys have had an astronaut on here. You had uh, <laughs> Danny from Pete and Pete, who was a childhood hero. I almost got a Petunia tattoo oh, when I was yes. old enough for yes. crying out loud. Brian, I just want to say thank you so much for spending time with us, um, for being so open and honest about your life and about your family. Um, and I, I do think that this is an important conversation and one that we should really have a lot more. Um, and so just thank you for, for not just coming on to Modern Dadhood to talk to us uh, about it, but for listening to Modern Dadhood that we appreciate yeah. as well. And so um, from the bottom of, of our collective heart here, we wish you you and your family all the best and just stay stay in touch with us oh i will don't worry about that thank you guys for doing so much glad to be a part of it yeah i don't know about you but after all this talk of uh, mental health issues i'm i'm feeling a, the need to to sort of cleanse just just a little bit just in our modern dadhood segment kind of way what do you I think? Do you I think? know if you're referring to what I hope you're mm. referring to, it starts off with the Gregorian monks. For anyone who's not aware, I'm talking about confessions. confessions. For their birthdays, we bought each of the girls balloons as a symbol of celebration. More than once, a helium balloon has silently floated by me and scared the absolute shit out of me. Confession. Confession. My children have many toys that they don't even realize make sounds because I intentionally never put batteries in them. Confession. 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 Remember those balloons I was just talking about? When they start to deflate after about a week, I take immense pleasure in quietly destroying them and tucking them into the trash can as a punishment for victimizing me. Confess. In many games, like the floor is lava, I declare the couch to be safe zone. Not because it's safe, but because it's comfortable. Confessions. 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 By far, the best part of playing school with my four-year-old daughter is when the teacher announces that it's nap time. Sinking into the couch for those 30 seconds is often the most relaxing part of my day. Of all the milestones I've been witness to, the most proud I've felt, by far, was hearing my son quote a movie for the first time. <laughs> what movie was it? Turbo. Don't know it. funny that we both had confessions about the couch 
We did. <laughs> I truly do love playing school only for that reason. I have permission to lay on the couch and close my eyes. Anytime you can work something like that into a game, that's a skill you gotta hone. You can't just throw it out there. It's gotta be, gotta be hidden right in a game. And you can't let on how much you truly enjoy it. No, because then it's, it, it's all over. You're getting smacked, you know? Yeah. Folks. <laughs> Folks. You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> you can find us at moderndadhood.com or Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Podcasts, pretty much anywhere that you prefer to source your podcasts. Do us a favor, please subscribe, and while you're there, rate the show. Maybe give us a quick review. Maybe even go so far as to tell a friend. We would love it if you would take a moment to follow us on social media. We are on Facebook and Instagram, as well as YouTube, where you'll see video clips of all of our guests and outtakes from the show and some hilarious segments that never made it into an episode. We would also invite you to drop us a line at hey, H-E-Y at moderndadhood.com anytime to be part of the conversation. Thank you to Casper Baby Pants and Spencer Albee and to Pete Morris at Red Vault Audio for making us sound fantastic and like we're in the same room. Mm-hmm. And thanks so much to Brian Manor for joining us on the show today. And I get to say the last bullet this time. It's a rarity. Kick it. Thank you for listening. How'd I do?